Hi, today we're going to have a look at networks for further mathematics. So this is basically chapter 23, our key definitions and looking through the applications of undirected graphs. So to begin with, we need to start having a look at what are our key definitions. So a network is basically just a group of um, objects that are connected. Often we talk about towns, places or people and looking at the connections between them. A graph is basically just a visual representation of a network. So each of our vertices represent an object in that network and each of the edges show the connections between them. So the vertices are points, a vertex is a singular, vertices are plural, and the edges, as I said, show the connections between them. Some of our key things that we need to know about networks um, we have adjacent vertices and adjacent vertices mean that there is a direct connection. So we can see here C and D are adjacent. An isolated vertex is one that has no adjacent vertices. So there's no edges connecting into vertex F, therefore it is isolated. Multiple edges is when we have more than one pathway between two sets of vertices. So we can see here A and B have two pathways shown. Same with B and C. So there are multiple edges between B and C as well. A loop is a special type of edge um, which begins and ends at the same vertex. An adjacency matrix shows the direct connections between each vertex. So the way it is set up is basically like a table but obviously in a matrix form. We can see here the column headers and the row headers are just the labels that are from the vertices and each of those numbers show the number of edges connecting between the two. So as we're reading across row A, we can see there are zero connections from A to A, so there's no loop at A. There are two connections from A to B. There is one connection from A to E. The thing to note with the loop though, we can see we do have a loop at E and it is only counted as one connection. So be aware that a loop is only ever counted as one in an adjacency matrix. The degree of the vertex talks about the total number of edges leaving the vertex, so the total number of ways you can get out of it. If we look at A, there are three edges leaving A, so it has a degree of A. B has six edges leaving it. And we can see C and vertex D, the degrees there. Be mindful with a loop, whilst it only counts for one in an adjacency matrix, it does actually count as two when we're talking about the degree. So we can see from E, there are a total of four ways or four pathways out of E. So just be aware of that when you're looking at the degree. And of course, an isolated vertex will always have a degree of zero. We can represent our number of degrees there in a table. And it's a good thing to know that the total number of degree so if we add all of those numbers together divide by two that gives us the total number of edges in that particular graph. Some other key definitions that we need to know a simple graph is basically any graph at all that has no loops and no multiple edges. A degenerate graph has only isolated edges so just a group of vertices no edges at all. A connected graph means that there are no isolated vertices at all. So it can have loops, it can have multiple edges, but the only stipulation there with a connected graph is no isolated vertices. And finally, a complete graph means there is a direct connection from each vertex to all others. So we can see here we've got a complete graph with four vertices, and we'll come back and talk more about those in a moment. Another style of graph is a bipartite graph. And you'll see more of these in chapter 24 when we start looking at applications. Basically, a bipartite graph shows two separate sets of data or information and shows the connections between those two sets. So we can see here we've got vertices A, B and C form one set of information and vertices D, E and F form a second set. There's no actual connection between A, B and C or D, E and F but there are connections between the two sets and that's what a bipartite graph shows. So if we 
have a look at this in the context of, say, uh, three countries competing in the Olympics, so Australia, Britain and Canada, and three events, diving, equestrian and fencing. We can see here that Australia, by a connection to D and to E, have meddled in the diving and the equestrian. And by the same token, both Britain and Canada have meddled in the fencing. So that's one application of these bipartite graphs. Moving on now to some of the other applications. When we're talking about paths in networks, we are talking about a sequence of edges. So basically a pathway through a graph is just how you would get from one point to another. In this graph, there are five different pathways from vertex A to vertex C. So we can go A through D to C, A through D around to B and back to C, directly from A to C, A through B, and finally A through B and D to C. So five different pathways from A to C. A circuit is any sequence of edges or any pathway that begins and ends at the same vertex. So a possible circuit through this particular graph would be A to D to C to B and back to A again. One way of showing circuits is to actually show it is a subgraph. So instead of drawing on top of the original graph, we actually take the information that's required and represent it as its own little graph. So you can see there the vertices are still the same, A, B, C and D. The original edges still apply, but we've just shown only the pathway that we need rather than the other information, so it's easier to see. Moving on to planar graphs. So a planar graph is a special type of graph. It is any graph that is shown where the edges only intersect at the vertices. So we can see we started off in this particular diagram with F having some intersections with other edges which weren't at vertices. So we need to be able to redraw a graph to make it planar. One way of doing that is to shift a vertex into the middle of, um, of the graph so that the intersections are not occurring. Another way is actually just to redraw edges around the outside. The reason we want to know about um, planar graphs is so that we can apply Euler's formula. So whenever you see the words planar graph or Euler's formula, this is what we're aiming to do. We have our, draw, our graph drawn as a planar graph and therefore we can apply the following rule where the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces will equal 2 if it is indeed a planar graph. So looking at the diagram here, we have four vertices in our graph there. We have five edges. And faces talks about the number of regions. Okay, so in this case we have one region which is shown in yellow, one shown in blue, and one shown in pink. So there's always what you can see from the shape plus an additional face for the outside. And in this case we've got so 4 minus 5 plus 3 equals 2. The left hand side of that equation equals the right hand side, therefore this graph is planar and it satisfies Euler's formula. We have another example drawn um, here. So again, the number of faces is uh, three. We have five vertices and six edges this time. The graph is still planar and therefore it does satisfy Euler's rule. In the second example here, at the moment our graph is not planar because we have some edges crossing where there are not vertices present. So before we can apply Euler's formula, we must redraw this graph so that it is planar and then that will allow us to actually count the number of faces correctly. So once it's redrawn as planar then we can see yes now I can count the number of edges and faces and vertices correctly and apply Euler's formula. Moving on to complete graphs. So a complete graph as we said before there's a direct connection between every vertex and once we get above complete graphs with four or five vertices, it becomes quite difficult to count the number of edges. Therefore, we use this formula. 
when we use a K to represent that it's a complete graph and the N is the number of vertices. So by taking a complete graph with five vertices, we can say, well, the number of edges will be five times four divided by two by using our rule there. Moving on to special types of paths and circuits. So the first one we look at is Euler paths and circuits. So an Euler path is something that uses every edge in a graph. And obviously an Euler circuit is a pathway that uses every edge and starts and finishes at the same vertex. The easy way to remember this, Euler, is for edges. So we have to use every edge. So we look here, start at A through B to C to A, down to E, across to D, up to C, and then back to E. So there we go, we've used every edge only once. I didn't have to lift my pen from the graph and I was able to trace around using all the edges and only using each one once. So one way to know whether you do have an Euler path or an Euler circuit is that if we have a connected graph, we can only have an Euler path if it contains two odd vertices. So when we talk about odd vertices, we mean the degree of the vertex. So we can see here that vertex A has a degree of three and three is an odd number. Vertex B has a degree of two, two is an even number. So if we look at all of the vertices there, A is odd and E is odd, B, C and D are all even. So that means I will have an Euler path. It will start at either vertex A or vertex E and finish at the other one. So before you even try and find whether there's an Euler path, you should be looking to see are there any odd vertices? If so, we want to start at one of them and finish at the other. If there's only one odd vertex, we can't have an Euler path. If there are three odd vertices, we can't have an Euler path. It must be two or none. If we have two, that actually means that we will have an Euler circuit. So if we look at this graph here, all of our vertices are of an even degree. So that means I could technically start anywhere in the graph and be able to use every edge and finish back where I started from, which would make it an Euler circuit. So here we can see from A to B to C to D to E to C, back across to A, down to E, and then back up to A again. So I've managed to get all the way around the graph and start and finish at vertex A. So we've created an Euler circuit there. The second type of paths and circuits we have are called Hamilton paths and circuits. So unlike Euler, we don't have to use every edge this time, but for a Hamilton path, I can only use every vertex once. So I can't go through the graph more sorry, through the vertices more than once. So here we can see so here we can see in the first example a Hamilton path. I can go from A to B, down to E, across to D, up to C and F. I haven't used all of the edges but I have used every vertex just once. In the second example, I'm going to make a Hamilton circuit. So I'm going to start at A, go to B, to C, to F, down to D, across to E, and back up to A again. So I've started where I finished. I've used every vertex just once. And again, there are some edges that I didn't need to use. And so this makes a Hamilton circuit. There's unfortunately no little tricks or rules with Hamilton paths and circuits. It's just a matter of trial and error. Unlike Euler, where we know about the degree and the odd degrees. Next application we're looking at, weighted graphs. So a weight is basically just a value that's associated with an edge. Normally a weight would represent the distance between the vertices or the time it takes to travel between one to the other or the number of objects that can actually flow along an edge at any given time. We tend to use weighted graphs to help us find the shortest paths and circuits. And a lot of the time that's just trial and error. 
A further application is what we call a minimum spanning tree. And that basically says, let's take the original graph and find, I guess, what we can call a bit of a skeleton. There are a couple of different methods for this, and your textbook goes through one called Prim's algorithm, where basically you'll pick a starting point and work your way through the graph using the smallest edges. I use a slightly different method, and basically what we're doing is we start with our graph here, and we say, well, what is the smallest possible number on the graph? Once we find that, so we can see where there's some edges that are twos. So let's use those twos in our skeleton or our minimum spanning tree. Then we say, well, the next smallest number is a three. So let's use those edges. And we can see those three edges there. The next is a four. So let's use those. And at this point, we, we stop and have a bit of a look and say, OK, so have I used all of the edges? Are all the vertices connected? The next smallest number would be the 5 at the top between F and H, but both of those vertices are already joined in. So instead of using that, I've looked at vertex D was the only one left that I needed to connect in. And so I look at the shortest possible edge or the smallest edge, smallest weight to connect in D, and that was the edge joining to A, which was a 6. We would then add up those edges and give our final value um, depending on what the question is actually asking you to do. Note, with a minimum spanning tree, you don't need to be able to get from one point to all the way through the graph without lifting your pen. It is meant to be like a skeleton or um, I guess, yeah, the internal workings of the graph. It doesn't have to flow in a nice pathway or a circuit. The number of edges you need will always be one less than the number of vertices. So if you started with seven vertices, you only need six edges to make it a minimum spanning tree because you just want the minimum number of connections to be able to show the, the uh, work of that graph. Another example here shows you again. So look for the smallest values. 